This is what I'm reading. Um, thank you all for being here on Zoom and in person. Uh, I'm just honestly so excited to speak to you on a topic I care deeply about. Um, and it means a lot that you took the time to be here today. So let's get through the slides and then have time for talk, I hope, after. Could you see this and pass it around? I have postcards. Um, okay, so one thing I want to be clear, this is, this session is not about questioning or accepting our or other sense of identities. It is questioning the default move to highlight gender in every day, almost every situation, and specifically for us in the classroom. Um, so my oh, not these so slides. So my goals for today are that at the end of the session we're aware of how constantly steeped in gender we are, if we're not already, that we take some time to slow down and consider how much our gender society is based on assumption and what effects that could have, and to equip, equip us with some neutral alternatives for everyday and classroom use. Um, also, if this is such a small group. I want to try and get through my points so we have some time to talk. So I'm sending your. Oh yes, I'm sending those around. Okay, and we what? are take one. I didn't know if you'd have notes, so it's just a card for you to. No, there was like. I didn't want to mess them up. Yeah, that's great. So I'm gonna start all my classes with a few minute, just like free writing, thinking time. <laughs> And I, gender is a topic that I'm sure we are all familiar with because we are required to self-identify or be identified with gender in many, many situations. Choosing a bathroom to use, to signing up for a fitness class, specifying male or female, um, going through the drive through at McDonald's and being yes ma'am or sitting based on the tone of your voice over a speaker. So here are some thinking questions. What are some ways I express myself as belonging to a gender? How much of this is force of habit or intentional as in, am I doing something in particular so that others recognize me as my gender? Do I consider any of my choices of gender expression to be an unquestionable way to recognize a person of my gender? How do I expect my gender to be recognized or acknowledged? In what ways? What happens if my gender is not highlighted? Why is it considered respect for someone to call out my or other people's gender on first impression? It's a lot of questions, so just, let's say like three or four minutes to kind of pick any of them to think about or free write on this general topic prompted by this list of questions. After the slides, I'll pull these questions back up and we can kind of see what you have to say or think. I'm gonna do three minutes on the clock.
I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, <laughs> hi, those of you on Zoom and everyone here. My name is Chris. I use they and them pronouns. And it's really good to be here with you today. Um, okay, so let's look at a whirlwind visual tour of genders everywhere. And think as we go through these, what are these images saying about gender, but implicitly or explicitly? Got hip reveals, closer part in the bathroom signs, hashtags. Hmm. Well, images such as for a woman and a man. Look at the various images and <laughs> identify any patterns, perhaps. What do these images say about gender? This is uh, from a children's book where you get to personalize it for your child. You put in their name and then it generates an image of this character. On the numbers, in 2022, only 33% of films featured a sole female protagonist in comparison with 50, more than 50 that had a sole male protagonist. And in a large number of children's books, so, along similar divisions, have male central characters and female central characters. I would like to point out that the numbers are low enough to be reported, to not be reported of any characters that aren't explicitly identified as female or male. So from all of this, okay, let's go back and we'll call the room and you like to say like, what are some things that you might have noticed about what you saw? Gender, Roseanne. Oh, his first plan. <laughs> um, <I'm sorry. laughs> Um, the haircuts for the children's book, mm -hmm. um, that was particularly striking to me. My godchild is assigned female and has a pixie cut, short hair, and she uses she, her pronouns. So she was playing the Harry Potter game, which, but, so she's playing whatever the new one is, where you just basically wander around and do stuff. I'm not really... <laughs> But it took her a long time going through the character profiles to find a female presenting character that had short hair like hers. Mm -hmm. um, and so this really kind of spoke, I mean, the, the second I looked at that, all of those children have sort of gendered hair lengths, not even styles, but lengths. The funny thing is, right, these books are written to be universal. So any child could be the main character of the story. Yet, for some reason, step one is identifying, is your child a boy or a girl? And if so, it populates these images that if you're a boy with long hair, to get a book that looks like your child, you have to select a girl. Yeah. And so, so we, know we can kind of address arguments in, I teach in the writing and reasoning program and we talk about deconstructing arguments and how there are arguments and everything. So from these images, we get four main arguments. The notion that everyone is gendered, either a girl, woman, or a boy, man. And girls and women look and act in a particular way. I have long hair. If you look at the pictures of the woman, man, Google image search, how many women are smiling? versus how many men are like grinning for the camera. Boys and men look and act in a particular way. Um, kind of remember the Batman versus Wonder Woman series. And think about other superhero movies. Superheroes are often gendered very explicitly in their names. And if you look at their styling, how many male, super, how many man superheroes have lots of skin showing, right? Um, another argument is that girls and women are fundamentally different from boys and men in ways that are obvious and telling. 
And then another side note is maleness is a cultural default and femaleness is an other category. And we see this in just a number of male central characters and books, movies. I don't know if you noticed, that's something that I bring up later on, but it's relevant now when we talk about text in class and don't specify gender. How many times do you hear someone use he mm -hmm. to reference the author? Or you're driving in a car and someone cuts you off and you're like, he did this, did that. Okay, so it's just um, some of the ideas that we are steeped in all the time that we may or may not be aware of are so explicit. So what are some of the problems associated with these? Arguments. One is that the fact, the idea that everyone can be categorized as man, woman, girl, boy, overlooks the reality of gender and sex diversity. Um, and I'm only bringing up like biological sex diversity to illustrate that there is a just already a fundamental disconnect. So if gender, the idea of two gender buckets, is meant to be associated with two biological sex buckets. Even then we have a problem if we note that about 2% of people do have intersex traits so cannot be neatly categorized as male or female by chromosomal or observable genitalia. So that's one in 50 people. If you have a world population of 8 billion, that's about 350 million who on a biological basis would not fit into a male or female category. And additionally, 13 million people in the USA, and this is from a 2022 Gallup poll, identify as LGBT. And nearly 2 million are trans. And the notion of queerness is directly related to the idea of gender diversity. We also, Differences, the associating specific differences to gender does not acknowledge that we are all different on an individual level, not reliably among gender lines, and forces people to kind of always be operating within or against the stereotype. So you are a particular way for a woman or for a boy or not like a woman, not like not like a girl, not like a boy. And so even, even when someone is trying to carve out their own path, they are still looked at within these binary gender perspectives. And I wanna talk a little bit about how that might be limiting in ways that we're not always aware of. Okay, back to that sexually balanced representation where we default to male. That's another problem. Um, okay, so one of the books we're reading for our class is Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes. And this quote, when we see a person, we are likely to experience the activation of any number of stereotypes associated with that person. So if you think about all the different messages we are getting about gender, alongside with the notion that we are encouraged to immediately associate a person to a gender based on what they look like or what they sound like. Um, it is understandable if you think about the amount of stereotypes and associations linked with genders. So the question to the room, in cultural consciousness, and I'm not saying you agree that these are of like women or like men as a default, but are there ideas that you commonly associate with men and women and what are they? Anyone? I'm the mother of a five-year-old. I do a lot of talking to the teacher like the PTA meetings, mothering kind of, is this what you're asking? Like I just do like traditional mom things, traditional mom things. Yeah, so there's a stereotype that women, mothers, mm -hmm. are the ones yeah. most involved in parenting. That goes along with, with other notions that female people are more empathetic, mm -hmm. maybe more 
naturally nurturing or are expected to be caregivers, while perhaps male persons are stoic, are more expected to have agency, are decision makers, et cetera, et cetera. So no, one, one thing that's gendered um, that I didn't realize was gendered um, is directional, directionality. So I think of things in, in terms of north, south, east, and west, not like go down to the gas station, make a right. And when I first got to Texas, people were like, oh, you sound like a boy. Because men, men apparently, I don't know if this is true, but it's been told to me that it's true, that men think more directionally. Cardinal direction. Yes. Like, you know, you go north two blocks, you make, you know, you, you go west for two, whatever. And women would say, go down to the target, make and make a right, go around the corner. I mean, and I, I is that true? Have you, you heard that? Yes. Well, that, that might, that might be part of it. Which is oh, also very gendered. Very gendered. Yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting. Because I was raised like that too. And they never said you sound like a girl. No, well, no, no. No, but it, you're right. But that's, I think that's the military. Oh, yeah, thing. that's awesome. Thank you. I was also raised in a military family. Yeah. I don't really know these things. Okay. No? Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's interesting. So, yeah. so many yeah. little things that just because we are so used to everything being gendered, mm -hmm. if we meet people, we meet five boys who think that way, we think, oh, this is what boys mm -hmm. are like. Even though that's not a reliable or like it's not a good critical thinking mm -hmm. mode to operate on, but we operate on this the time um so tests that social psychologists use to measure implicit associations operate on the assumption that when someone is presented with a trigger it immediately um unintentionally automatically activates concepts that you kind of soak up in your environment so even if you are a staunch feminist who doesn't think women are a certain way the fact that we have all grown up in a society and a culture that pushes this messaging on every level means that on an unconscious level these ideas are there and unless you like deliberately no call them out to make them as explicit in order to counter them then you know we are all operating on some level of implicit um bias um so Another quote, when gender is salient in the environment or when we categorize someone as male or female with the idea of implicit association in mind, gender stereotypes are automatically primed. And I pull this out as particularly important because if you think about the notion that when gender is salient, that means we have these stereotypes just kind of present even if we're not consciously aware of them and as you noted in the examples and the stuff we're talking about gender is almost always salient in the environment we live in and we, until we tune into it we kind of just go through blindly not noticing how gendered it is and kind of the undercurrents that gender salience triggers in fact um Besides stereotyping of others, which we all can agree is problematic, I would assume, there are more recent studies being done on um, looking into how stereotype activation affects your perception of self, mm -hmm. with the idea that the self-concept is malleable, like how we think of ourselves can affect how we perform in different places. Um, one French study had high school students rating the truth of well, They had a control group that was not gender prime. And then the group that was primed by gender, they had them rate the truth about the stereotype that boys are better at math and girls are better at the arts. So they like prime this gender mm -hmm. stereotype in these children's minds and then had the students themselves rate how like rate how they did on a standardized test that they all took two years earlier. And they found that these high school students altered their own memories of how they performed based on gender stereotypes. So they had the male students giving themselves an average of 3% higher than they did on that, while female students gave themselves an average of 3% lower 
than how they actually performed when it came to math. And there are other studies like that that are kind of assessing how these unconscious associations affect the way we look at ourselves. Um, so, and this is not something we can control because like we talk about in writer, right? We, the whole notion of unconscious bias is their unconscious and something that's soaked in through the environment. So the big question is, knowing that, what do we do? How do we avoid this? Um, one thing that I advocate for and that more people, especially in other countries, are advocating for is the use of gender neutral language. Um, this is a quote saying gender neutral language. Could. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> I actually realized I didn't have this quote in my notes. Um, so, a 2019 study that involved 3,000 Swedish people. Because in 2015, Sweden adopted the gender neutral term hen alongside existing terms equivalent to he and she. So in 2019, they did a study. Um, some researchers did a study um, where they gave participants an androgynous cartoon of a figure walking a dog and instructed the participants in three groups to write down what was happening using only neutral pronouns, only female pronouns, or only male pronouns. And then they had participants after doing that, they had them to com complete a short story about a person with name and gender unspecified. And they found that um, more people who use neutral pronouns tended to pick neutral names and neutral pronouns in completing their story. And then the next step was they had participants answer questions that examine their views on women and LGBT. And they found that those who use neutral pronouns for the cartoon were more likely to uh, appear to have more positive feelings towards LGBT people and women. And so there is beginning to have more evidence because people are starting to look into it to support the idea that using neutral language can influence attitudes and beliefs about gender equality and tolerance towards LGBT individuals by decreasing the cognitive salience of males and increasing the salience of females. And we have to put this quote into context of our cultural environment in which uh, a male presence is largely more dominant and more central. And so by reducing our reliance on calling into attention gender that allows for a little bit more freedom and space in our minds away from implicit associations um, that show more acceptance towards non-male centric points of view. Um, here, when we use language that actively includes women and LGBT people, it makes a real difference in reducing gender stereotyping. Using gender neutral language as a positive step towards creating a world where everyone is accepted without exception. And bringing this back to why this is relevant to us as educators. Because we are in a unique position to model the kind of open-minded thinking and inquiry that we want to encourage in our students. And if you think about the students we work with who are growing up in this culture and environment where everything is gendered along a binary, along pretty stereotypical lines for the most part, we have a small opportunity to demonstrate that it is possible to think about the world outside of these rigid binary gendered lines. Um, so let me ask yourself, how often do we gender students and authors when gender or sex is not relevant or evident? Um, and here's another, if we're gonna make it a little bit um, academic, how often is the sex but which is more egregious, not specifying gender or sex in situations where these details are irrelevant or misgendering a person. I think in a time where there are more people who are expressing non-conforming and expressing themselves in non-conforming ways, uh, you could have a man with long hair in a dress who would 
if you are, if we are assuming gender, we might reference as her. And in a classroom situation when there is a power dynamic, that student might not feel comfortable saying anything. And I'm in my 30s, and it is terrifying for me to be in the world the way I want to be. And I can only imagine what it's like for 18, 19 year olds who might be still figuring themselves out or questioning their own gender identity or expression or not wanting to think of themselves within a rigid binary view, but finding themselves automatically gendered in almost every situation because we do, they have to choose. Are they a man or a woman when they go to the bathroom? They have to, there are not very many neutral spaces out there. So we have a unique opportunity to carve small neutral spaces for our students in a way that they wouldn't otherwise find you here. So that's cool. Okay, and, and again, to um, make it more academic, again, we are in a time where more people are adopting neutral pronouns. So for example, gender theorist Judith Butler uses they then pronouns, but for most of their career, they were known as female using she, her pronouns. So if a student's reading a text and just looking at the biography on the back of the book, they say, oh, Judith Butler is a woman and I'm gonna write with she and her, and they would technically, technically be correct if they didn't do extensive more looking into the fact that Butler now goes by they and them. Um, so it's just always safer to, because if you think about a Venn diagram of gender, they and them, is neutral in the sense that it also encompasses people who are he's and she's, whereas he's and she's are specific to somebody. Okay, so whatever our personal feelings might be on gender diversity, we have to acknowledge that trans and non-conforming people exist and that texts for what students may look like may not accurately reflect their gender identity. And so insisting on assumption-based gender recognition reinforces binary gendered norms that, back to what we were talking about earlier, activate stereotypes and get in the way of inclusiveness. So why, more on why this should matter. Students may not feel safe presenting themselves the way they wish. Students may not have had the opportunity to experience an environment where gender is not safe or the opportunity to opt into being gender. And again, students tend to default to maleness when referencing unspecified figures, which continues to reinforce a male-centric imbalance in power and representation. And when there is an imbalance in power and representation, not doing anything only maintains the status quo. To challenge imbalances, we have to call them out and take active, like take action to counter what that is. I have a question. For the second bullet point, can you explain what that means in our context in a classroom? Yeah, um, so until, well, I think for most of our students, especially in an climate and area that we live in, they may not have experienced much gender diversity in their upbringing. And this is a generalization, but a lot of, well, for most people, that's how they grew up. Um, and I'm actually going to get to that. Okay. Very yeah, sure. Sure, sure, sure. No. <laughs> yeah, a, a little bit more on why this should matter and maybe to drive it home more. Again, because for students who are not non conforming, you find affirmation in your gender all around because of the fact that everything is male, female. Um, there's like woman empowerment, there's sororities and fraternities, and there are so many spaces in which a gendered, a binary gendered person has affirmation. There are not many spaces for people to find security and safety outside of gender. And it is in a classroom, I think it is, and knowing that it is hard to speak out to someone who is gendering you, especially in a position of authority somewhat, it is safer to kind of err on the side that one of your students could be non-conforming and just not saying anything because it's uncomfortable and scary. 
if you have long hair and wearing a dress and you sit at a group at a table with the females and someone and you reference the girl, then you know they're put on the spot and being either say, Hey, I'm not a girl, or you just swallow it and pretend and that it's just like one other push of men that you see every day if you are not conforming. And the reason this is so important besides you know, the academic, we can model critical thinking, etc., is because we can literally be life saving. Um, this is, these numbers are from the 2022 Trevor Project's National Survey on Health. Forty five percent of LGBTQ youth seriously considered attempting suicide. Nearly one in five trans and non-binary youth did attempt suicide. That's twenty percent of trans and non-binary youth tried to take their lives. Fewer than one in three trans and non-binary youth found their home to be gender affirming. LGBT youth who found their school to be affirming reported lower rates of attempting suicide. And youth, LGBT youth living in a community, community that is accepting of LGBT people reported significantly lower rates of attempting suicide. So back to the idea that most, a lot of our students grew up, might have grown up in places where it was not safe or comfortable to be queer. And now they're in a place where they are meeting other people and like we have the opportunity to provide a safe environment. And it's not quite enough to say that, um, I'm gonna call everybody ladies and gentlemen, and if someone is queer, they can tell me they're they don't fall in that category and then I can adjust because they might not, they might be afraid to. They don't know if you're accepting. They don't know if you're tolerant. They don't know if you have thought about these things and are willing to consider them. And they put themselves at very real risk when you have to confront a person. So it is safer to, as an educator to provide, deliberately provide a neutral space and allow students to be gendered or not. And I'm going to talk like specifically about some ways we can do that. Um, okay, introduce your pronouns. Include them in email signatures. Use a pronoun pin. Give students the opportunity to specify pronouns if they wish. So be more specific about this. Is there something I'm doing? Let's see, I'm trying to fix this. So I introduce myself to my students as non-binary, and I say this by telling them that I personally don't do gender in this like kind of really big amorphous way, and I use they and them as pronouns. And as part of my practice of uh, making my classroom a neutral space, I say my default is to refer to people with and them or just their names and if you wish to specify a pronoun like please do and I will respect that so students are as we introduce students are invited to introduce a pronoun but they're not required to and I say I don't encourage the practice of insisting that people provide pronouns because this can be problematic for trans or non-conforming students to be put on the spot in that way so what I do is I say you know we're all I'm going to call you they and them, or just your name. And then I give them postcards, these <laughs> cards that went around. And I ask them to write down any pertinent info about themselves. And I keep these, including pronouns or other personal issues that might affect their semester that they want me to know about. And I keep all these cards in the file cabinet in my office and refer to them as needed. So if they do not specify a pronoun, I just call them by their name. So it's really important to me to call them by name. Um, oh, use neutral honorifics. Ask students to refrain from gendering you with honorifics. And that's a personal preference. But for me, I don't, when they call me ma'am, I said please don't do that. I'm not Mrs. Anything. They call me, I don't mind if students call me by my first name. Some of them call me Professor Ko, Professor <laughs> K. It's a bit of a learning curve because also for a lot of them, they are not used to the idea that someone could be identified outside of Mrs. or Ma'am. Um, but I am not punitive if they mess up. I just do gentle reminders. 
and pronoun pins. Here's another thing. Uh, there is the idea, I think the, the popular notion is, okay, wear a pronoun pin or specify your gender if you have a name that is vague, if your gender is not clear. Or if you look like not clearly a gender, you should wear a pin. But the problem with that, it is, again, operating on the assumption that we looked at before, that gender looks a certain way. So even if you feel that you, no matter what, someone will look at you and see you as a woman, what does it hurt to be deliberate about telling people, I, you, I, I use she, her? Um, that just kind of, again, models the practice of people of people's gender being recognized by what they tell you not just what they look like. They, they use students' names rather than pronouns. Yeah, and when while I'm still figuring out their names in like the first couple of weeks of class, if I want to call on somebody, green hat, you know, red t-shirt in the back, ponytail in the corner, just referencing clearly identifiable features rather than something that has a kind of inbaked assumption to it. When we talk about authors or subjects, I try to use just author names. And I mean, when we write about texts, we use the last name anyway. So we kind of just do that in our discussion, unless it's unless gender is specified in the text, because it's a crucial part of what it's saying, or the author gender is relevant to the discussion. Let's say we're analyzing texts written by women, you know, that that is important. But let's say we're discussing a text that has nothing to do with the author's personal identity. There is no real need to identify the author as she, her, he, him. And kind of keeping things neutral also, you know, models to students that they don't have to use a gender pronoun when they're talking about someone they don't know. And we, we, we do this all the time because we're used to it, where our language is not used to doing something other than she or he. And it's, it's more difficult when you don't hear that and you don't see it. So the more we do this, the more used to it our students get. And use neutral language whenever an option. And just as an exercise, like consider how reliant you are on gender language and to what effect. Um, whether it's, you know, using gender pronouns to reference inanimate objects. And if you do this, if you also know what type of things you use or you hear people use with a female pronoun as opposed to a male pronoun. Because that also kind of shows certain implicit associations that we make. Um, well, do you think some of that could be tied to people speaking other languages? I mean, if you're speaking a romance language, you're speaking French and Italian, your your object is male, is masculine or, fem or feminine. You have la, you have il, you have il is in Italian, il is the, ma the male version. Uh, so things become masculine and feminine. Do you have, what do you, how would you respond to that? Like, what what is the research showing about at that? How is that? How is that being handled in other cultures, like in Europe, and where these, where things, things are gendered? I would say I would need to do more research. Yeah, oh, no, no, it's fascinating. I mean, that. I mean, I think that that is something that, um, you know, I've read that you know where some of this is really hard to kind of get your head around for people. They say, well, but you know, uh, words in Spanish, French, Italian are masculine or feminine words. So I don't know, how do you, do you know any research there a, about this? There was something in the time, New York Times a few years ago now mm -hmm. talking about that. It was an infographic too, which was, I can look it up and send it yeah, to I'd you. I'd love to see it. There, there, are, there is a, a widening movement in a lot of these countries that use um, gendered um, nouns really? to, yeah. to shift that and and like you said in Sweden they added hen which was yeah. maybe something between their uh, male and female pronouns so I mean I, I think that there is movement it's challenging well I think we're lucky in yeah. Texas I had a friend who wrote an article for the Times about y'all you know y'all is great in Texas I mean we're lucky you don't say um, I mean you shouldn't shouldn't go into a room and say how are you guys doing 
and um, but yeah, y'all, we're, we're we can we can use y'all easily. Y'all, I didn't y'all, use y'all, 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 Could I ask a question from the one whose pronouns are she, her, y'all? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Linda Abramson Evans. I teach our international grad students and TAs, and it's advanced English as a second language for our international uh, students in all departments of the university. And one of the things that's a challenge for them, you know, besides dealing with, you know, the the polishing the language and learning the culture is uh, becoming accustomed to the diversity of uh, Americans, you know, their students, if they're working as TAs or just their classmates and professors. So I just wanted to mention that every semester we do a diversity session and invite staff, students, other faculty to come in and share uh, stories of how, you know, cultural, racial, ethnic, religious, and I think in this case, gender um, discrimination can happen and how to deal with it. So it's it's just a way that, you know, trying to help our international students um, in their work uh, as students and professionals uh, at this university. So I'll, I'll put my contacts in the chat, but our session this semester is on Monday, October 16th, I think, uh, on the syllabus. And it's just open to as many people as we can fit in our tiny classroom. We're in the basement of Higher Hall, um, G01, and uh, it's not very big, but you know, we usually like to have a few guests and, you know, diversity officers and other and students and uh, really anyone whose schedule fits that time. It's 2.30 in the afternoon on Mondays is our class, 2.30 to 5.30. And we just let the students talk and uh, interact with uh, any guests that we have as speakers and participants. So thank you for letting me share that. Linda, I mean, I think it's wonderful that you have this as part of the orientation for international students. I don't know if you know, but I was an international student. I came to Texas when I was 16. Um, I grew up in Malaysia where the language is, gender is not baked into the grammar. Right. And so I think that's such an interesting yeah. angle to think about. But also, even for languages that it's not part of the grammatical structure, like it's so part of our language. Like there are words. One of the exercises I do with my children is because I've been trying to use neutral language, sometimes I struggle. If there is a word that doesn't have a neutral option, we're like, hey, what about this? And then we kind of try to make up stuff. And I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, but even in English, it is a, such a big challenge because we are so used to, first of all, defining and classifying people by their sex at birth. And then from there, that channels your path, right? If you are female and you become a parent, you're not just a female parent, you're a mother. And mother contains within that word all sorts of connotations that a, just a female sex parent doesn't have. Mm -hmm. The word father is the gender term for a male sexed parent. But the word father contains a wealth of connotations that if you think about all the gender stereotypes feeds into and is reinforced by. And if so, if you think of yourself, not just as a parent, how can I be the best parent? But how can I be the best father or best mother? You might find yourself back to the concept of the idea of the self concept being malleable, thinking of yourself and your parenting within certain lines that don't necessarily um, serve like the whole of humanity that you could be as a parent. Uh, but quickly, we are getting close on time. So some gender terms and neutral alternatives, sister, brother, sibling, parent, grown up, children, child, nibbling. Whoa. <laughs> Nicks or professor or, I don't know. <laughs> what are nibblings? Um, gender neutral for niece and no, nephew. I never heard that. Nibbling. I like that. <laughs> Where we are so used to referring to the children of our siblings as something gendered, 
nibbling is an alternative that people have come up with because niece and nephew, like what's, what's another option? And some people want another option. Now, cousin is an interesting one because um, I, I, I can't remember where, but I was reading that in some cultures, everybody is a cousin. Mm -hmm. yeah, you have, every, your, your aunts, your uncles, your great aunts, your, yeah, so that, that, that makes sense. Like cousins twice removed right. or right. what not. Um, pronouns, they, them, theirs, or name. There are like new pronouns, newer mm -hmm. neo pronouns that people are using, but to keep saying simple, they, them, theirs. And some people who think, I, I mean, you know, I, I think that gender and words are personal and you choose what words you want for you. But I do, I disagree with the notion that they and them is, okay. I know people who, who have gender who don't like to be called they and them because it feels it takes away their gender. But what I say to that is, and you know, if you don't want me to call you they and them, I will call you by your gendered pronoun. That's fine. But I, I, I think it is a somewhat misguided notion because we use they and them to refer to a group of people. And we don't think that means we're taking away all the genders of those people. Yes. I will add a little bit further. Why are people sometimes so uh, entrenched in their gender? Mm -hmm. Just, put, I mean, I don't think we're going to answer that today. <laughs> uh, just one of the questions, but of the it, thinking questions is like, what is lost if your gender is not highlighted verbally in a moment? Like my father is very obsessed with my son being a boy. Like, you know, I don't remember when he said something and my son is named Guy. He has a gender name. <laughs> but his name is Guy. And he was like, I'm just a boy. And my very old dad <laughs> was like, that's right. You're a boy, you know, in a way that I was like, Gross, you know, but it was people are entrenched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also know that this is, I have to go, so I just want to go. But um, so my son goes to DISD schools and they just had Grand Pals Day, mm -hmm. which I yes, thought was wonderful. Yes, yes. Because again, it I don't think it has to do with the gender issue, but it has to do with a, a family diversity that they recognize and that there's different kinds of grand pals in the world and so just to see that in like wording somewhere for I thought that that was really uh, uh, proud to see that you know I mean I think it's tough because we're in Texas for goodness sakes you know like if you go to New York and California there are just in terms of what you said about space the bathrooms are not not all bathrooms are gender there are many non-gendered bathrooms. We, I don't see, there's certainly not one here on campus. And I don't see them around here. Is there one? Okay, oh, we're, this is brand new. Right, so that's great. That's great. But you know, that is not something that we see routinely in Dallas. But it, it is something you, receive, you see routinely in many, many other places. It's just not here. Yeah, because the infrastructure is so gendered, it makes it all the more important that if we have an opportunity to do so, and if we are considering that, you know, maybe it is important, maybe it does make a difference, that we put in that effort. So let's put my notes here. Aha! <laughs> no matter how you feel about gender, if there is reason to believe that using neutral language can foster an environment where, where marginalized students feel safer and supported as they figure themselves out, um, if it can reduce maybe there's a chance that it reduces unconscious bias in myself and others and promote acceptance of diverse persons and ex diverse persons and perspectives then it's worth the effort on my part to be conscious of my language and to choose a neutral option if there is um quickly a couple more children kids everyone everyone people folks friends peeps fam i do i personally love peeps <laughs> And um, my kids make fun of me, but I call snowmen snow fam. <laughs> <laughs> sir, ma'am, just excuse me. Hello. Or yes, ma'am, just of course, certainly. You got it. I don't know. There's the whole sir, ma'am thing is not fun for me. Again, you're in the South. And right. if you were in New York, you'd have a, you don't hear people calling. I mean, it's very interesting. It's such a regional thing, too. You know, we're really. Just like any effort to counter 
known by his father. Um, so here's just some words that you can maybe put in your vocabulary to consider using. And if you do make a choice to try and use more neutral language, don't be too hard on yourself. It's a, it is a big adjustment. I mean, I went 30 years, right, without even thinking, like, maybe I want to do this. And once I started doing it because of what I was noticing and the research I was doing, it became so, like, how can... Why, does, why doesn't everybody care about this? Because it's something that I care about so deeply and affects me very personally as a person who has deliberately chosen to step outside of the gender binary. I mean, we're literally unlearning habits formed from birth for most of us. But I also think that by us modeling neutrality, we help make it easier for the people around us, like for these young people who are starting to go to college and they have ideas of what life is like, you know, they're hearing something different. And even if they don't like go full tilt ahead, it's, it's there. It's an option other than the no option they've maybe been presented with before. Um, and like for my kids, they're growing up super gender, just despite my best efforts, just because <laughs> of school and, sure. you know, everywhere. During, when we were in COVID quarantine, my then five, four, five, six-year-old dressed how they want, did how they want. But when we started going back out to play with children, it started to, the first thing kids would ask would be not, what's your name? Do you want to play? It's, are you a boy or a girl? And that made my child feel not good something that was on their mind you just wanted to play but it's I think gender is so implicit in our interactions that it goes unnoticed and when I call it out you know, I'm the one rocking the bow even though it's being shoved in my face like literally everywhere I go um, so we have an opportunity to kind of make it a li little bit easier on other people then we maybe had it to unlearn habits. And slowly, slowly, there are the very strong potential of positive effects. You're saying like there are other parts of the country that are already like, this isn't so out there, um, but it was like very out there for where we live. And I just yeah. think it's all the more important to think about. Um, so let's go back to these questions I put up at the start, is there, you know, we only have a few minutes left, but is there any, I've talked a long time, is there anything <laughs> anyone else would like to add to this quote unquote discussion? Open up space for questions and thoughts. Um, we talked a lot about language. Are there other ways to make our students feel more included in the classroom? So there's language, we talked about bathrooms. Are there other things we can be aware of or try to help promote? Mine is a, maybe in other classrooms in which like physical bodies matter more, like dance or something. Like in my classroom, because we just spent the whole time talking, mm -hmm. language is the primary thing. But <laughs> I would avoid using presume gender as a way to divide mm -hmm. or even so my kid goes to DISD and then one of the after school programs is cotillion mm -hmm. and it made me really uncomfortable when I started looking at all of it and it's very like if you sign up if you're a girl you have to wear a dress and you learn how to lead if you're a boy you wear a suit and you learn how to follow and to me it's like you know there's a way to do this in a sense that either okay, everybody, we have 30 kids, 15 of you are going to lead today, 15 of you are going to follow. And then at our next lesson, well, we're going to swap. If you led last time, you follow this time. If you followed last time, you lead. So it's really just about considering the ways, if gender is salient in your environment, mm -hmm. what can you do to kind of take gender out of it, but still accomplish the same? I went on a buccaneer pirate cruise with my kid in Florida. And it was like cool. Until there was this one this one part where they had to separate the group into two just for space. 
And instead of just going, okay, everyone on this side of the line, you're going to get your face painted. Everyone on this side, you're going to swab the deck. It was, okay, all the girls, you're doing this. All the boys, you do that. And when I kind of said something about it to the people I was with, they were like, well, it's just a way to divide the group. It's an easy way to do. Like, yes, that's true. But there's also other ways to do what you're trying to achieve that doesn't make a child have to like be, okay, I'm a girl. I have to be with this. Or if you are a trans or non-conforming child, having to, in that moment, make the choice to choose to be with the group you belong to or the group that you look like so you don't get in trouble. Here, I'm gonna invite us to continue the conversation outside. There's oh, another thing starting at two here. So I wanna allocate some time, but 